Welcome. You have learned earlier about the success of renal transplantation owing, amongst others, to better immunosuppression. Now we will focus on one of the most common complications after transplantation, post-transplant diabetes. You will learn how common it is, what the risk factors are, how it develops, and what the impact is on transplant outcome, and of, of course, how we can prevent or treat it. Post-transplant diabetes is a common complication after transplantation, affecting up to 30% of recipients. Here you see a figure showing the incidence of diabetes before and after transplantation for two calcineurin inhibitors, cyclosporin shown in the blue line and tacrolimus in the red line. The moment of transplantation is depicted by the vertical line in the middle of the picture. You can see that both drugs are associated with an increased incidence of diabetes after transplantation, but tacrolimus is associated with a higher incidence than cyclosporin. There are many consistent risk factors for post-transplant diabetes. Some are non-modifiable because they relate to age or genetic susceptibility, such as ethnicity, sex, or HLA. Others are modifiable and relate to obesity, metabolic syndrome, or type of immunosuppression. Take a minute to look at these factors. The pathophysiology of post-transplant diabetes resembles that of type 2 diabetes in a way that it's characterized by both insulin resistance and impaired secretion from beta cell dysfunction. After transplantation, the immunosuppressive medication is another risk. Both cyclosporin and tacrolimus diminish transcription of insulin, thereby accelerating post-transplant diabetes. For reasons yet unclear, tacrolimus, the most potent and widely used calcineurin inhibitor, is also the most diabetogenic. For details on the precise molecular mechanisms, there's an optional reading. So, do corticosteroids also contribute to post-transplant diabetes? Well, high-dose steroids, such as used to treat acute rejection, are toxic for beta cells and impair insulin secretion while stimulating glucagon. At the same time, steroids can induce insulin resistance via muscle atrophy and a diminished capillary network for glucose disposal. Steroids also increase hepatic gluconeogenesis. Nonetheless, studies investigating steroid-free regimens find no significant impact of low-dose maintenance prednisolone for the development of post-transplant diabetes. Remember, a daily prednisolone dose of 5 mg is very equivalent to a person's own cortisol production, which is diminished with the use of exogenous steroids, and probably not so toxic. Obesity is another risk factor. It is the major determinant of insulin resistance in the general population. The constellation of central or visceral obesity, dyslipidemia, and hypertension is a cluster of risk factors for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes. This cluster is also called the metabolic syndrome or unhealthy obesity. Studies have shown that many transplant recipients suffer from obesity. Patients with end-stage renal disease are increasingly overweight and obese at time of transplantation. The prevalence of obese transplant recipients in the past decades parallels the obesity epidemic in the general population, as shown here for the U.S. population. Take a closer look at the figure. The prevalence of obesity in the transplant population is actually higher than in the general U.S. population. How can this be explained? You can discuss on the forum and there's also some additional reading. So how do we diagnose post-transplant diabetes? We use largely the same criteria as for other types of diabetes, as you have heard in Module 2. Let's now look at the impact. Once post-transplant diabetes is diagnosed, it may have a deleterious impact on the outcome of transplantation. Post-transplant diabetes has been associated in various studies with increased risk for infections and cardiovascular events, as well as diminished patient and graft survival. There is still debate whether the impact on graft survival is independent of patient mortality.
A study published in 2008 found the impact of post-transplant diabetes on long-term graft survival equivalent to that of acute rejection. Here you can see the time to transplant failure from any cause for both post-transplant diabetes, the NODM line, and acute rejection, the AR line. Both have similar impact on transplant failure, albeit that acute rejection caused more death sensor graft loss, whereas post-transplant diabetes caused more often recipient death with a functioning allograft. This would implicate that the drugs to prevent acute rejection, and thus prolong graft survival, may cause post-transplant diabetes in approximately one-third of recipients and limit the same graft survival via increased cardiovascular mortality of the recipient. It sounds like a catch-22. So what can we do to prevent or treat post-transplant diabetes? We may change immunosuppression. A few small studies have shown that the conversion of tacrolimus to cyclosporin normalized glucose abnormalities even many months after post-transplant diabetes manifested itself, without jeopardizing the efficacy of immunosuppression. Whether this approach is safe for recipients at higher risk of rejection remains unknown. It also remains unclear whether the withdrawal or avoidance of low-dose maintenance steroids significantly prevents post-transplant diabetes. But a healthy diet and exercise aimed at losing weight and increasing muscle mass will most likely contribute to the prevention and treatment of diabetes. With regard to antihyperglycemic drugs, a recent study from Vienna showed that early initiation of insulin for post-operative hyperglycemia was actually protective of post-transplant diabetes, up to one year post-transplant. Thus far, it remains unknown to what extent metformin or other more novel antihyperglycemic drugs can prevent post-transplant diabetes on a large scale. These medications are nonetheless used in practice once post-transplant diabetes manifests based on their role and efficacy in type 2 diabetes. Unfortunately, we lack transplant-specific studies. So what should we learn from this lecture? Post-transplant diabetes is a common complication after renal transplantation, which negatively impacts long-term success of renal transplantation. It resembles type 2 diabetes in the general population with regard to obesity, but immunosuppressive drugs have a clear impact on the increased incidence of diabetes as well. Preventive strategies, other than switching immunosuppression, remain largely uninvestigated. Post-transplant diabetes is one of the most important risk factors for cardiovascular disease, which will be discussed in the next lecture.